Good afternoon. Welcome to the weekly edition of The Wrap. I'm Laura Leslie, WRL Capital Bureau Chief. And I'm Brian Anderson, WRL State Government Reporter. So it's been some week. Um, we spent a lot of time this week on the Cawthorn beat. I think that's pretty much what everybody's talking about. Um, Brian, you did a bunch of these stories. And then I know on Monday I covered one that I thought was really interesting about um, a PAC affiliated with uh, Tom Tillis running an ad against Madison Cawthorn calling him a liar which was really pretty amazing. Um, it's not the kind of thing you have a sitting senator calling a sitting representative. Yeah, I mean, Madison Cawthorn making headlines as usual uh, and no surprise there, but the latest news that I reported on this week was him being cited for bringing a loaded gun to a Charlotte airport. And I should say this is the second time He's been cited for bringing a loaded gun to an airport. The first one he did that was in Asheville last year. So Cawthorn put out an Instagram video. And uh, in that description, he basically said, please I, don't do this. I made a mistake. But in the Instagram video itself, he had sort of poked fun at the situation. Well, and then uh, the day after that, <clears throat> we learned that he... Uh, had been somebody had, uh, basically sort of accused him of insider trading because of his involvement with a cryptocurrency scheme. Um, it's a meme coin, I understand. I've never heard that term, but you learn something new every day uh, called the Let's Go Brandon coin, LGB. And uh, so he apparently had some advanced knowledge that they were going to get a big sponsor for this coin and the value of the cryptocurrency spike. But we don't actually know at this point whether he actually did own any of the cryptocurrency. So that's kind of up in the air. But Natillis was starting to call for um, a house ethics investigation <laughs> into him. So uh, it's, you know, it's been a, it's been a rough week for Madison Cawthorn. Yeah. I mean, you could say it's been a rough couple of months for Madison Cawthorn. It, we can go back to his comments of calling Ukraine's president a thug mm -hmm. over in early March when we reported that. And it's just really been an onslaught of attacks and they've come from Democrats. They've come from Republicans as well. And some of these are just resurfaced so things and others are just self-inflicted wounds. That I was going to say, wounds. there's a lot of self goals going on here too. I think, um, you know, definitely like the gun at the airport, come on. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> right now we still, you know, we saw some polling this week, um, not too sure about it, but showing that um, Cawthorn may be slipping a little bit in the polls, but it's important to remember, you know, as we go into this primary, you only have to get 30% now, not 40. So I mean, there's a pretty big field out in his district, but um, it's pretty hard to beat the name recognition that goes with being a sitting congressman. Um, so I'll, it'll be interesting to see whether or not this actually this actually affected things. Yeah, T quick time travel back 2020. You had Cawthorn with, there was a field of 12 candidates. This year, there's only eight candidates. So it's a little bit harder to envision a runoff. And back then there wasn't an incumbent. Cawthorn's an incumbent now. So it's it's a little bit of a different situation for sure. Right. So um, also this week, early voting started. Um, finally, <laughs> excuse me for this. Uh, <clears throat> this spring. 10 weeks past due. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so that started what I think Thursday. So you had a story about the first district, didn't you? Yes. So the first congressional district in North Carolina is a big test for Democrats. That's the seat that belongs to Congressman G.K. Butterfield, who is retiring. And the two main competitors in this race are state Senator Don Davis and former state Senator Erica Smith. Butterfield this week threw his support behind Don Davis, who's viewed as the moderate candidate. And earlier this month, I spoke with the candidates. I spoke with voters down in Pitt County. And really what it seems to come down to is Davis seems to be winning the electability argument of the day. And can he win a general election in a seat that's a little bit more conservative? And for Smith, she has some ideas that are very popular among many liberal groups, voting groups, environmental groups. She's backed by Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts, a progressive liberal senator. So the tension really seems to be the ideas and the electability. And one interesting exchange I've got to mention is I, I spoke with a voter and he asked Erica Smith this question about uh, voting rights. And it was a, a spot on answer for Smith. It was this person's most important policy priority. Yet when I interview him after that, 
he says, I'm going to vote for Davis because we need to, to win in a general. And us Black voters, we have to care about electability. We can't care as much about our niche policy priorities. That's interesting. I think a lot of Democrats are saying that these days. Um, but anyway, we'll see. 2020, this could be a tough year. Um, I did a piece on the 13th district. There are 13 candidates running for that seat. Um, eight of them are Republicans. Five of them are Democrats. Um, it is really anybody's guess at this point. I mean, I think Wiley Nichols got the funding edge for the on the Democratic side. Um, on the on the Republican side, it's you know it's hard to say because you've got um, you've got a, a Trump endorsement for Bo Hines, and then you've also got Kelly Daughtry, I think, who has a lot of establishment support. Um, and then there's um, uh, D Devan Barber, who I didn't even get a chance to talk to, um, who is apparently also coming up and has his first TV ad on this week. And then we had uh, Renee Elmers. Um, and also I talked to Kent Kiersey, who's a first time, uh, first time newcomer as well to politics. So uh, that's a real scrum in that. I have no, I have no idea who's going to win that. Five Democrats on in that primary with Sam Searcy and Wiley Nickel being the two front runners and the Republican side, there's eight candidates, and we just had some fresh reporting a few moments ago that was about Bo Hines. He had decided that he is going to move to uh, Fuquay, Verena there, and this fulfills a campaign promise that he's he's made saying he'd move before the election. It also seeks to, to eliminate some of those carpetbagger allegations that have been thrown his way. He was a resident in the area when he was a student at NC State back in 2014 and voted in Wake County, but then he left for an Ivy League school and he ultimately came back and has run in many different districts. So we have a good story out that is at ncapital.com that breaks down the evolution of what districts he's run in. And it also focuses on this, this recent move to Wake County. Uh, another great story on NC Capital is uh, Travis Fain's really good story about Surrey County. This is a fascinating story. So apparently the, the head of the Republican Party in Surrey County has been threatening the head of the election board in Surrey County, saying he's going to get her fired, he's going to sue her unless she gives him access to voting machines because he says that my pillow CEO, Mike Lindell, has as data that shows that there was transmission of voting information from Surrey County. Um, really not true, <laughs> not, not true. And, and so all of this is sort of being bolstered by uh, this other fellow, his last name is Frank, and he's sort of made these arguments in other states too and been roundly rejected. Um, so, you know, it, Travis did a, a, you know, had a conversation with that elections director and you know, some of her, they've had to have the police escort some of their staff sometimes at times, you know, quitting time when they go out to the parking lot. So it's, a, you know, that's a, I mean, Surrey County voted for Trump. I mean, can it's I, not can like I Trump lost. interject? This yeah. is a state Trump won <laughs> in <Exactly>. 2020. <laughs> this exactly. is not Pennsylvania. This is not Wisconsin. This is not Arizona. This isn't a state Trump lost. You're threatening an election official in a state that's already been decided for the guy you support. And in a deep red county to boot, you know, I mean, you know, Surrey County went for Trump overwhelmingly. So I, you know, I, I don't know, but it's just a, it's one of those crazy stories. You're like, this cannot possibly be true. Another really crazy story this week, it was in the Robisonian. Um, I haven't had a chance to, uh, to write this one yet, but maybe I will. Uh, Robinson County Board of Elections does not have a Facebook page, right? Well, somebody created a Facebook page saying it was the Robinson County Board of Elections, and then they turned around and endorsed a candidate for a municipal uh, seat on, on that page. And Which so the, county boards don't endorse candidates, of course. <laughs> of course they don't. And so, you know, of course this drew questions and, you know, the Robinson uh, County election director is like, we don't have a Facebook page. So they don't know who did this, whether it was this guy or one of this guy's opponents or who knows what, but really fascinating, you know, kind of how to election, election shenanigans in 2022 involving social media. That's, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've seen lots of conspiracy theories since 2020, and we've seen lots of different strategies for disinformation at the local level and just another extension of it, sadly. Yeah. And you wrote a great story this week about um, 
basically some controversy surrounding one of the redistricting experts that um, Democrats and, and the courts leaned on um, and in redrawing the congressional maps for this upcoming election. Yeah, Sam Wong is the gentleman's name, and he was, you might remember, the Princeton gerrymandering uh, project that provides some nonpartisan analyses of maps across all these states that are doing redistricting. And North Carolina passed a map in November, and that was challenged, went through the court system, and ultimately it was up to a three-judge panel with the help of three nonpartisan redistricting experts known as special masters, who were then supported by four research assistants. And Sam Wong was one of those four research assistants. Now I spoke with Bob Orr, who is one of those special masters and is a former uh, Supreme Court, state Supreme Court justice in North Carolina. And he told me that Wong was involved in analyzing these legislatures, uh, redrawn maps, but he did didn't have a role in the drawing or in crafting the congressional map that ended up being used. So uh, we've seen Republicans outraged about Wong previously. They sought to remove him as an, right. as an assistant. That didn't work. And now this is just fueling some new concerns. Uh, the issue at stake is basically he's under an investigation at Princeton University for potentially, allegedly manipulating data when analyzing New Jersey data, not North Carolina data. Right, notably not North Carolina. But that's why he's under fire and that's why some conservatives in North Carolina are upset and trying to link this guy to, to the congressional redistricting that took place. I think that is just, well, I should mention um, Dallas Woodhouse, longtime. He was a Republican Party director for a while, and he, um, uh, spokesperson, and he's been working over at John Locke, um, has a new position with a policy group in South Carolina. So he's going to change to a different Carolina, but he's still going to be around, I'm sure. And I'm sure we'll see lots of him on Twitter, but best of luck to you, Dallas. And he enjoys Oreo cookies as well. There's a fun video interview exchange I had with him. So you can, you can go to Brian R. Anderson on Twitter if you want to hear Dallas's thoughts on Oreo cookies and how they're a larger euphemism for the Democratic Party. Nice. All right. That, that's about it for me. Anything else for you, Brian? Uh, just really quick, we had a Senate debate, uh, the, fi- the fourth and final one. You can read about that at nccapital.com. Ted Budd wasn't there. There were a few takeaways. It was heated. And you can check out our website if you want to learn more about that. All right, great. Well, folks, have a great weekend and we will catch you next week here on The Wrap.